Hey everyone, welcome back to Megabot's Top 100 Games of All Time. This is number, this is video 9. And this will be our top 30 through 21. And to kick us off is Glenmore, of course, from 2010. It's a 2 to 5 like, tile lane game from Matthias Kramer, published by Aaliyah and Robinsberger many moons ago. Um, Glenmore was one of the first games I ever played. Um, I played it when I was pretty solidly only a two player player. So uh, I learned this game as as two players, and I got kind of frustrated with the levels of luck in it. Um, at two to three players, it um, has a little die that you roll that takes away a, a tile kind of randomly. And so Glenmar was the first game where I started doing house rules. Um, we did several iterations where you, you would play two players, and you'd build kind of a, build a white and a green one, and they would build a red and a blue one or whatever. And then you would do a combined score of the two, because um, there was definitely a couple of fun tests where you would just take the highest of any one given city, so you would tank one city to bolster the other, and that was a pretty fun one as well. But um, ultimately, it is a fabulous four to five player game. It's lightweight, easy to learn, and it uses um, kind of a round action selection that you now see a little bit more popular these days in things like Patchwork, but um, for Glenmore to use it, it was a pretty darn new concept. Um, Takedo also has kind of an element of it. Um, Glenmore is a little hard to find these days. Um, it does have a reworked version on its way. It was supposed to be out this year, but it looks like 2018 is more likely. Matthias Kramer has some other fabulous titles, and there was a reworking of this game called Loon Architects, but it wasn't done with Matthias, and he kind of, he's like, all right, fellows, you do what you want, but they took that as a he totally gave us our blessing and they kind of ran with it. So I, I hope all that got worked out eventually. Um, I have not played that because I have my Glenmore already and I think it's pretty fabulous. The Really the only thing I'm looking for in the rework is if they will redo some of the castles. Like Loch Ness is a really powerful castle and if you get it early on in the game, it's a little bit broken. So maybe they'll tear the deck or something. Number 29 is Grand Austria Hotel from 2015. It's a pretty new title. It says two to four players in the box, but it's a pretty solidly three-player game. Um, whatever other people have to say about that, I, I don't mind. If you want to play it at any other count, I will not play it with you unless we are three players. Maybe two, but at two players, I do also house rule this to add one extra die and to uh, flush the, the guests that are on offer in the hotel after a while. Um, this is a dice selection game with a little bit of resource management and uh, kind of a puzzly nature because you're trying to put guests into a hotel and as you fill different wings of your hotel and get the guests squared away, you get points and money and it's got that fabulous track in the middle that over the course of the game you need to get to certain thresholds um, of uh, of these emperor points, uh, otherwise you take huge hits. Um, a crap ton of player powers and cards and different effects and different choices and just so many things. And the dice drafting itself is really interesting. You also see something like that in La Granja. Um, this game in particular allows you to pass your choice on your turn and then come back and take a die away from the die pool and re-roll the die pool. And you can do that over and over and kind of like mitigate some of the luck when there's no dice fiddling in the game. Um, uh, just a stellar game and I've quite loved it. Uh, number 28, <laughs> this is another foul. Uh, this is Aquasphere from 2014, the year of the Feld. Uh, this is a two to four player game published by Tasty Minstrel out here in the States. It was Hall Games and Pegasus out in Europe. Um, what can I say about Aquasphere? This is probably the highest ranking game that I will very rarely win. I, I, there is some weird block in my brain of how to do this game well. Um, so in the game you are going to be wandering around this kind of journey quest, circular, underwater thingy lab. And you're trying to build submarines and clear out octopods and collect gems and uh, do all kinds of fun things. And the way that you do that is by programming robots and then sending your programmed robots to take an action. So everything has that microtransaction flavor, kind of like Imperial Settlers, where you do this to do this to do that to do this, all the while kind of combating other people and kind of racing to get things. Biggest downside I would say in this whole game, and this isn't a huge downside, I've still played this game 
quite a number of times, eight, eight to 10 plays probably. Um, I would say that the scoring, there's, you have to build your player lab. It's just too many points not to do that every game. So it's kind of a, a almost a requirement to win. And then you can kind of choose a secondary aspect. It's similar to Russian railroads that way where you have to do X and then you can do A, B, or C to take home a win. But um, that, that first, that playing player lab, building that out is just too powerful to ignore. So not always my favorite thing in point salad games because those are some of my favorite games, but uh, still a very, very solid game. And if you ever want to be EFL, this is a really good way to do it. <laughs> Uh, number 27 is Clinique from 2014. This is a two to four player game designed and published by Alban Viard. Now, Alban Viard is probably more well known for small city or for town center at this point, but Clinique is the one that for some reason just speaks to me. Players are putting on their player board trying to build a hospital. And to do that, you put in doctors and patients. And of course, every time you put a doctor or patient in your hotel, in your hospital, you must park their car in, in uh, the parking lot. So you have this beautiful spatial puzzle of trying to build a hotel and the rooms have to be, this one has to be next to this one in order to see patients and all of this other stuff. You have to put administration staff in every, in every uh, floor and the higher the floors are, the more points they are. But the whole time you're like mitigating their stupid cars and your stupid parking lot, trying to build garages to take care of them. Um, the doctors get dumber over time. The patients get sicker. Uh, it's just cl clinic for better or worse is just one of those perfect games just for me. And I've taught it to a few people, not a lot, because it's a lot to kind of take in and learn. And it's not a very fun learn. It's much more fun your second or third play. But... I imagine if I pushed it, I could probably get more plays of this in, and it might be a good idea. It might be that time right about now. So I, I would say that if you find a copy of Clinique, um, it's worth picking up. It's a little harder of his games to find right now. So, I mean, try, try any of his games. They're all complicated and wonderful, but by far, this is my favorite of all of his games. Um, next, we have Lagranha. I was just speaking about the dice selection in the game. But Lagranha at number 26 is a 2014 title from Spielworks publisher. Um, it was also done by Pearl Games. It was brought over here by Stronghold Games. Um, the de designers are named Mike and Odie. <laughs> they have their full names on this box, but have since shortened them for us lovely folks that don't want to completely destroy their names. And this is a one to four player game. I cannot speak to the solo game of this. I don't usually solo game that often, but from two to four, it is perfect and fabulous and I like it on all the counts. In a in a loving way we call La Granja Agricoluna because it has kind of elements of lots of different games and then they're kind of shoved together in, in this game. So you have some card stuff from Agricola, you have some breeding things, you have almost the exact temple out of Luna in the market stalls here, um, but the game has a life all its own. It really holds up to its to it on its own. Um, so in the game, you have cards that you're going to build out as fields. You're going to put them in um, to help you get cards or money. You're going to use them for powers. You're going to have them orders that you can fill. But you're very limited on how many cards you can play around. Generally one unless you pay for extra. After that, you're going to kind of populate things and get resources. You go through this fabulous little dice draft that gets you more stuff. And then you take turns um, making deliveries, which are actions in the game. Most deliveries you had to pay for, some of them you got to kind of bid on or anti-bid on based on how long you'd like your siesta to be that round. Um, and there's points everywhere, but the points are hard to find as well. Um, you have to fill out these whole little market thingies and you have to get lots of resources paid in, but you're also playing against the other players so they don't get there first. And it's a very interesting game overall. Uh, next up, we have Imperial Settlers. <laughs> Number 25 is, uh, we, I just mentioned this sort of, it's a 2014 title from Ignacy, uh, published by Portal Games, and it fits one to four players. I have never played this solo game again, but the two to four works very well. Um, Imperial Settlers was Ignacy's kind of mea culpa, in a way. He had designed 51st State as one of his first published titles, and in 51st State, it's asymmetrical and very 
tactical. Everyone is trying to build out their tableau and mess with their opponent's tableaus. And there's card drafting. But Ignacy was finding that every time someone asked if they could do something in the game, his answer was no. Well, can I combo, combo these cards? No. Can I do this? Can, can, I, can I feed this contact token into these? No. And so he actually started feeling really bad that everything in the game was so tight and controlled. So he built Imperial Settlers to be the answer to that. In this game, yes, yes, you can do that. Of course you can combo those like that. Of course you can spend your resources in whatever order you want. Of course if you have extra guys left, you can spend them to get cards. And so he built an asymmetrical, very tactical game where you're trying to destroy other players' tableaus and create one of your own. But in it, he made that small microtransaction into kind of a pleasure, not a pain. It's not as punishing in any way. And it's brighter and cheerier and it's got a farming theme. Um, let's talk a couple of downsides. I'd say that playing the Japanese um, race out just as your first race to play is very difficult. It's harder to play them. Whereas playing, I think it was the Barbarians, was really easy. Um, so not all skill levels are equal in all the races. Since then, he has built up um, three, four, four expansions. Um, the first of which I didn't care for very much. It was called Why, Why Can't We Be Friends? The Atlantean and Aztec expansions are really nicely done, and uh, they, they, they match the fun levels of the first original races. Um, so I really like this one, and yes, I probably like 51st State personally a little bit better, but Imperial Settlers plays far more often with far more players, so it gets higher on the list, because that's important to me is the ability to get it played. <laughs> um, number 24 is Concordia. Concordia is a 2013 title for Matt Gertz. It fits two to five players and is published by Rio Grande. Um, this is possibly one of the most endearing games I've ever played or taught. Uh, Concordia, everyone loves it. It just, it's so simple and fun and easy to teach and easy to play, but lots of strategy and the, the scores are always close and it feels really close. So in it, you have this big map and players are running around with their colonists trying to get resources and build more things. <laughs> and the way that you do that is you buy cards and the cards are, it's not a deck builder, but you buy the cards into your hand. And at some point you can pick up the cards you've already played and put them back into your hand. But if you want, you could just buy cards forever and never have to do that. Um, that's probably not gonna happen, but you technically could. Uh, but the game is only over once someone has built all of their wood or if you have, as a group, bought all of the cards. So uh, it's a solidly 90 minute euro that is so dang simple to teach but has depth of strategy for days. As I go about my gaming life, I find that all Matt Gertz games could probably fit into what I just said about this. <laughs> easy to play, easy to teach, and just a big pleasure to do so. Number 23, this is Race for the Galaxy, a 2007 card game from Thomas Lehman by Rio Grande Games, and it fits two to four players and actually plays probably best at two. Um, this was my first game. Uh, this was the game that got me into gaming, so I have a special love for it, and I also have a special exhaustion for it because I don't believe this is a game that I can really easily play anymore. Uh, very recently, um, both a tabletop and an app version hit, and I tried to play it, and I tried to have fun, but I think I, I got my lifelong plays of it out of my system, uh, probably a hundred games of it or so. <laughs> so uh, this game, I, everyone will talk to you about symbology being so difficult and trying to get through all the symbols and remember what everything does, but for me, it was my first game, and it was kind of my first challenge, and the way that I that I interpreted it was that, okay, I didn't quite understand this the first time, so I should just do it again until I get it. And it helped me break into medium to heavyweight games um, faster than a lot of people because I just kind of took my own um, challenge, as it were, to find all the strategies and figure it out. Um, at, at the time, I played with my then boyfriend, and I crushed him one game. 
and I just destroyed him like nothing else. And the next game, he saw what I had done, and he played anti all of the things I had done, and he just smashed the floor with me. So we went back and forth for like six plays of just one person crushing the other, just devastating. Um, so by the time we really started to see how all the strategies in a hobby game work, we were really having so much fun. And this, this definitely was the reason I got into hobby gaming the way I am today. Um, uh, next is Ponzi Scheme from 2015. It's a three to five player game from Jesse Lee, published by Homo Sapiens Lab and then into the States at Taste Your Menstrual Games. Um, I would say this is really just a four player game, in, in my opinion. I did find out that most people hate this game, that the type of strategy that belongs in this game is not necessarily everybody's favorite. I only found this out because I made a lot of players play it at one time. I put this into my charity tournament this year and we had 80 players playing it all at one time. And by far, hands down, this is the one that most people hated or they loved it. But it's definitely not a strategy game where your strategy is which loans you take in the game. I think for the most part, most people can make a best choice about which loans to take over time and pay your interest. But what you really need to do is evaluate based on your trades with other players, how much a given piece of victory points is worth and try and manipulate the table from there. And the game is all player versus player. And the only communication in the game is those dollar amounts going across the table. Now, in the rules, it says you could take notes, and I have seen what would happen if you wanted to make the best strategy possible and take notes and play this like it's, you know, you're going on the pro tour, but the most fun you're going to have with this game is over a few beers with your very close friends. So I have been pretty successful as well as a con game where everyone is looking to have a good time, but you definitely can't have the player at the table that doesn't like playing games if they lose. So... That's the lesson learned this year, but I still love it. And as my friend Nicholas pointed out the other day, I think I'm the, I have the second highest amount of logged plays of this game of anyone in Boy King Geek. And it's no, it's no secret that I happen to love this game. Uh, number 21 and our last one for tonight is Shipyard, a 2009 game from Check Games Edition. It is a two to four player game designed by Vladimir Stuckey. Uh, he also did Prodigal's Club, which was seen earlier on in the videos, or um, Last Will. He has a couple other games and an upcoming game called Pulsar Something Something from Czech Games. I'm really excited about that. Uh, Shipyard is the Rondel Rondel game. It has about six rondels <laughs> in it. Uh, each player has secret goals that they're working toward to build ships, build pieces on the ships, put guys on the ships and send the ships out to sea and score them. And there's a little map that you're building. And all of this is done with a rondelle action selection. And the other part of the action selection, your main action selection is also a rondelle. And you get money for taking actions that are behind other players. And um, you can't take the same one twice, but you can jump ahead as far as you want, but you'll miss out on other things. And it's just so dang good and fun. And it does that wonderful mind puzzle thing where you just forget yourself and you can just plan all that you want in a row and still try and change slightly based on what other people do. There's a little bit of tactical nature in it as well. Um, it is not the prettiest of board games, but I don't really care. And I think the colors are muted enough where you can see what you need to at a glance, which is super nice for having 5 million different types of pieces. Uh, it is definitely um, one of those games that, if made today and put on Kickstarter, would probably have wood and miniatures and all kinds of things, but I like the little stripped-down games these days. I, I don't want every game to be this deluxified monster of a thing, so just nice, humble shipyard is all I ask. <laughs> uh, so that's all for today. Um, I hope you enjoy these videos. I've been really enjoying doing them. Uh, if you haven't seen any of the other top 100, it is in this playlist. And you can subscribe here if you like. You can comment on the video if you want to tell me something about games that I've talked about or things that I might not have said because I don't know what I'm saying. 
Um, but I really enjoy you being here and thank you very much. Have a good night.